Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to this panel on sexual violence in unstable environments. My name is Amanda Taub. I'm a journalist at The New York Times, and I'm going to be moderating a panel with these three wonderful activists, experts, um, and individuals who are committed to working on this important issue. Uh, so the, each panelist is going to first have a few minutes to discuss their work and the issues that they see as central to this important matter. And then we'll have a brief discussion followed by a Q&A session. So I would like to begin by asking Pirette Pap, apologies if I'm butchering your name, um, who is the head of advocacy and campaigning for the Mukwege Foundation, um, who is an expert not only in the policy and advocacy issues around this matter, but also has agreed today to bring the voices of survivors into this panel by reading a letter, a statement that was written by one of them um, to address all of you. So if you'd like to begin. So I'm gonna read a, a letter uh, from a survivor from DRC, Congo. Uh, thanks a lot for, for having me in this panel and thanks a lot for giving some space for this uh, testimony. Hello to you, my rapist, my perpetrator. You will know that I have not forgotten and I will never. You will pretend it never happened, but if I were you, I would feel ashamed. You will always be a man without heart or honor. Know that I'm repairing my world, the one you destroyed in the blink of an eye, profiting from the war to destroy everything that mattered to me. Brothers, husbands, children, families, remember the moment when you abused their sisters, their wives, and their daughters. You humiliated me, you terrorized me, as well as my loved ones. All these screams, these cries, were not only coming from me. I'm sure you remember it too. Do you remember destroying the life of that little girl? She cried, she suffered, but you did not stop. You even mutilated her genitals. I don't know whether I can call you a man, because for me you have nothing human left in you. Deep inside of you, you do not recognize that women are sacred. Do you imag imagine that even years after, they still suffer deep inside of them? I do not know how to qualify this unbearable, excruciating, devastating, torturing, inconsolable pain that you imposed on me. At times, every minute, every hour was a living hell. I could not do anything anymore. I cried. I isolated myself from the world. My life was hanging by a thread which could break at any moment. I was constantly wondering, what did I do in the world to deserve this? There were always a thousand and one reasons to despair, but the only reason to hope was my honor. Deep within my pain, I knew that I was better than you. Since then, I've decided to face you. You know I already fought to recover my pride, my honor, and my strength. Despite the situation in my country, I'm involved in agriculture, animal husbandry, and small trade. I became an active actor in the development of my community, despite all the obstacles I had to overcome. I am fighting, and I will keep fighting so that you can never do again what you did. And if one day you try, I will be here standing in your way with every legal possibility. Thank you. Um, and now, um, if we could have uh, Céline Bardet who is an international lawyer, who is an expert on the use of courts and other legal mechanisms to bring justice to victims of sexual violence in unstable environments. If you could speak about um, your work and your kind of recommendations on this issue. Okay, uh, thank you. I apologize in advance because I'm very sick. I think <laughs> you can hear it. So I apologize for that. Uh, yeah, thank you. I think like listening to um, you know, the words of um, this survivor uh, says it all. Um, myself, I'm a lawyer, I'm an international criminal investigator, and I'm specialized in war crimes, actually. So I've been working on, and I'm still working, on conflict zone uh, all over the world. And then, um, little by little, I could see uh, what I call these invisible people who've been you know, victims of rape and sexual violence and conflict zone. And they were not either the priority of criminal investigation, 
because we always think that in war, you know, A, these things happen, what can we do? And second, there is, I realize also how much there was a need to explain what is sexual violence in conflict or what we call fragile zone, why it is happening uh, within a specific context that are war, it can be refugee camp, it can be the migration route at the moment. Um, so I decided to found um, an NGO that is called We Are Not Weapons of War, so I think also it's self-explanatory. Um, and focusing on um, justice, of course, because that's my DNA and my work and that's what I do the best because I've prosecuted war criminals and among them I've pro prosecuted some of them for sexual violence. So we need to understand that this is constitutive of international crime. But I realize also that, um, again, there was a deep need and what the Mukwege Foundation is doing and what Pierrette was showing is that there's a deep need to give voices to this survivor because they are the one who, who can say you know, what they want, what they feel, who they are. And to me, you know, working on justice, it's also um, a way of uh, putting back some kind of dignity uh, for them, uh, at least for some of them. I don't know if I have to stop there. Just one, one small, I mean, story to tell you what make you make me really decide to engage myself in this. Though, is that I, the first case I've prosecuted in Bosnia was actually uh, rape. And at this time in 2009, there was no prosecution at national level in Bosnia about sexual violence. And it took me one year and a half to convince this woman. Her name is Vieta. And I remember her, um, I mean, all my life, I mean, she's still alive, I'm still in touch with her. It was really a long thing. Um, and a family didn't want her to testify and etc. It was about um, an event, I mean, uh, happening, um, it was 15 years after the war. She was the only survivor, she's been raped many times and, and etc. But just one thing, when this, finally we could identify the perpetrator and they were sentenced, um, First rape was recognized as a, as a war crime, so she was recognized as a victim of war crime which, that, gave, that give, uh, gave her uh, access to some compensation and it was very important for her. Um, and the, the perpetrators were sentenced for five years, so I was completely, I was like, oh my God, you know, when she's going to see it's only five years, she's going to, because she was very scared, I mean, I, I put it very short, but you can imagine. And she had this sentence, she said, you know, they believed me. And I was like, but who are you talking about? I said, the judges, they believed me. People, they believed me. And this has changed my life totally because I have understood that it doesn't matter how many years they got. It does, all of this doesn't matter. What mattered is that we believed her, that at a point someone put you know, a boss on the table and say, yeah, it did happen and you were a victim and so yeah, all of this is very important, and so that's what I'm trying to continue to do. Thank you very much. And then our final panelist is Eve Francis, who is the CEO of Deloitte in Luxembourg, and is going to speak about the role that the private sector can have on this issue. Okay, thank you very much, Amanda. Uh, so indeed, I'm here with uh, different hats, with no hair, but with different hats. Um, so I'm speaking a little bit as the CEO of Deloitte, um, where of, of obviously I've got a clear ideas on how the private sector can bridge the links with the public sector in order to remediate causes like the one we, which is the topic of the debate. At the same time, I'm also very much involved since many years with our NGOs and especially with Doctors Without Borders and I was quite astonished over the years to see that the number of interventions of Doctors Without Borders on sexual violence was keeping on growing year on year on. and. Um, Obviously, as a teacher, I teach ethics in finance, and uh, I would like later, maybe in the panel, to make the link a little bit on how impact finance can really help also to remediate some of these causes. And it's, it's got a lot of links in that topic, 
even in education, the way we teach our students on finance, for example, the topic of ethics in finance is relatively new, which is odd that in business schools it's taken so long to teach about ethics in finance. Since 2008 and the disasters that happened, things are changing now and it's quite comforting to see the number of students which are very keen to know more about that and to go beyond the models of investing being seen as just risk return but putting impact now in the middle of it and that's all the notion of social finance impact finance and maybe we can come back to that later in the panel um, and Pierrot, if you would like to now take a few minutes to discuss your work with the Mukwege Foundation. Thank you. So the, um, the testimony I share with you is from a, a woman from um, DRC. And uh, Dr. Mukwege met this woman some years ago already. And I think it's really based on the strength, as you, you, you got from the message that she wrote, that he decided to, um, uh, to propose to the Mukwege Foundation to gather women from different continents to come together. And that's how we organized for the first time last year in Geneva, and the Grand Duchess was there, a big event where survivors from 15 different countries came together. And by doing so, uh, I think we first, we challenged the assumption that women victims cannot speak for themselves. We challenged this uh, vision that uh, they are not strong, which is completely not true. And uh, you saw it from the extract in the movie, from the testimony of Celine. Um, they came together, the, the, the power in the room was amazing. They really said there's nothing about us without us. And now they are organizing. Uh, and uh, we as Mukwege Foundation, it's one of our goals, is really to put survivor voices at the core of what we do and to really make sure they can meet and they can decide on what they want to do. Coming from Colombia, Kosovo, Liberia, DRC, Bangladesh, uh, Guatemala, wherever they come from, they share the same experience of being a woman, victims of sexual violence in conflict, but also of uh, being so strong to want to change the world and to act at their community level, but also at international level. So that's really one at the core of our work is to make sure that their voices are being heard and that the, the new discourse, the new discussions on sexual violence cannot be without them. And the two other main aspects of our work is to make sure that they can have access to care uh, once they've been victims. That's what Dr. Mukwege is doing in Congo with uh, the hospital. This holistic uh, care, medical, psychological, socioeconomic and legal aid. But we really want that to happen everywhere. So we're working with other countries, but we're also advocating for that to be a, a human rights standard. And finally, but we will come back to that, we also want to um, support the demands of survivor. And one of the key demands is reparations. They want to be recognized for the harm they suffer from, and they want to have uh, both compensation and the symbolic reparation. Uh, as you said, uh, when she said, uh, they believed me, I think this is the, the most crucial thing for survivors, and most of them uh, have not had this recognition. So that's uh, why we are calling for an international mechanism to, to answer to this need. Thank you very much. So one thing listening to all of you that I think is a theme that comes forward is an idea that victims should not be the ones who should bear the burdens of this violence alone. That we should find a way to shift the burdens onto the perpetrators so that it deters these actions and onto perhaps the international community public and private sector organizations so they can help alleviate some of the harm that it causes. And so I would like to ask, first of all, each of you to discuss a way that you have either tried to do this or a way you could see forward towards shifting that burden. How, who could pick up some of the burden? Who can we shift it to? And what impact do you think that might have? So Celine, if you would like to go first. Um, OK. Well, you know, when I, okay, when I talk about, when we look at justice, definitely we look at perpetrator, because this is an, uh, what we call an individual criminal responsibility. But I believe that, um, why, the question is, okay, why are we talking about that today? Okay, we're talking about that because I think there is a huge and urgent need, first of all, to understand what we're talking about. And I think it's still very much needed. Um, and when we understand what it is about, 
that this is a tool, you know, that this is this is systematic, this some at some point in some area this is massive, then it's not only, so to speak, about uh, a victim and a perpetrator. It's about we're talking here about crime against humanity, we are talking about war crime. This is what we are talking about. So then uh, that concerns all of us. I mean, I don't even understand why I mean, somebody coming and yesterday I had a question actually from a journalist, which was very interesting, like why it should concern people? Well, I don't even understand the question, <laughs> you know, I do not understand the question. Uh, it concerns all of us. So, so I think the idea of yeah, reparation and, and, and uh, the fact that we acknowledge that is very important, that we acknowledge these people. Now, the other question I'm asking myself is, you know, I'm, I'm working on, on the field uh, for almost 20 years in uh, a number of countries that, to be honest, I don't even know how many, uh, all over the world. I, I work from Iraq to, to, to uh, Eastern Africa, very different country, different culture, different situation, but still the same thing. And it was very interesting what he was saying also that we see uh, that there is um, a growing um, number of cases, which could be, you know, result, I mean, that could be two things, because we know it has been ongoing for a long time, but also now, because we are talking about it, then there are more reporting, and also international organizations are looking at it, you know, more, uh, like, seriously. But we need to go uh, much more than that, because we are talking about sexual violence in conflict since, to be honest, few years. I founded We Are Not Weapon of War in 2014, and I, I based it in France. I'm French, but I, I could have based it anywhere else. I did it here because in France we were almost not talking about the topic. Very little, you know. And um, we need to uh, understand again what we are talking about, and we need to give proper response. On the opposite, there is lots of money and program, international program that have been developed and I see all of them and not that I want to shoot on anything. You know, I work for the UN, I work for and I, I continue to collaborate with this institution. But that's also the question. There was a um, global um, forum that was held in 2014 in London, which was a great initiative. But here we are, four years after. And me, what I see on the ground is people um, most of them, they are not even identified. And the big majority of them, they do not have access to service. They do not. They are left there without absolutely no service, no you know, medical uh, support, no psychosocial support, not, not even legal support. I don't even talk about that. So I think that, yes, it concerns all of us. Uh, I don't think we can go home and, and, you know, there are lots of horrible things in the world. <laughs> we know all of that. Um, I'm working on crime against humanity, so trust me, I mean, I think I'm really digging in the, <laughs> I don't know, in, in the, I don't know if there is worse than, than this type of crime. It's not the question, but we need really, as the Grand Duchess said, we need to move from indignation and say, oh my God, it's horrible, and emotion. We have all lots of emotion. It's emotional to hear about this letter. It's emotional to listen to a survivor. But we need to move really uh, more, you know? We, need, we cannot stay and cry and then go home. And we need to do much more. And we need to think how we're going to do it in order that there is an impact that responds to the wish and the need of the survivor and not the way we think. It should be done. Thank you very much. Um, Eve, if you could um, take up the same question, um, what can be done to shift the burden? And in particular, what levers does the private sector have to pull on to make this happen? Okay. Um, so as Sidin said, it really concerns all of us. And so the burden is on each and every one of us. And if I start, I'll come to your, your question specifically on the private sector, but even the public sector. We've heard about the United Nations Sustainable Goals and the fact that every country commits to minimum of 0.7% to cooperation. A handful of countries stick to the rule. Luxembourg is one of them, and I'm so proud for that. But many countries don't follow the rules. And you've got this famous formula, which is the billion to trillion. 
billion means this is the funding which is available for humanitarian causes and trillion is the need. And so there's a massive difference and that difference has to come in a way from private sector involvement. Maybe I don't want to steal the words of Céline, but for example, Céline could testify on how some private actors, which are very much involved in the technology space or in the financial space, can, without committing huge resources, but simply because of the skills they have in terms of finding digital ways, maybe to report crimes, to keep audit trails, to make the job of the prosecutor easier in terms of having real evidence to, to pursue people. And so there are a lot of initiatives which are being done like that, and which, again, very often people think about giving money, and obviously we need to do that, but we can also give competence to some actors and really quickly make a difference. I suppose maybe you will, you will want to cover that in a second. And so that type of, of like, examples is really very illustrative. And again, I could talk also of impact for finance, traditional investments looking at risk return only, philanthropy giving money to good causes, and impact for finance is saying, let's get the private sector to invest in some initiatives whereby it could get financial return, or no financial return, but financial return which would be conditioned upon the positive impact that would have been created by the investment. And this is a field which is fairly new. There's the Global Inve Impact Investing Network, GIN, which was launched 10 years ago. But you see already quite a lot of things happening in that space. And I think it would be great to see finance a bit more involved in this than what we see often too many speculative activities without real impacts on, on the real world. So I'd like to just stay with that point for a moment because I think that it is... Okay. Um, I think often it is more kind of palatable to focus on positive investments for positive impact. But one thing that comes up in this space is whether private actors should be expected to sacrifice, to sacrifice profits, to sacrifice new opportunities in order to not empower government or not, you know, other armed groups who engage in sexual violence. And so I wonder about your thoughts on what the private sector could do in that regard, um, how they might be able to you know, make such sacrifices palatable to their boards, how they might incorporate them into their strategies. Okay. Um, sacrificing profits. You will rarely see a CEO which is prepared to do that. But let's look at it in a different, from a different angle. A lot of companies, when they start doing the type of investments or developments that I was referring to in, a, a minute ago, may think, I'm not paid for this. Why the hell would I do this? If you follow some economists, even Nobel Prizes like Milton Friedman, he always said, shareholder value should be the only criteria for a firm. And I believe this is wrong. And by the way, you see a lot of new theories on that, saying a company has got multiple stakeholders. And I share with you my experience. When you take some of your bright technology consultants and you offer them to work on a topic like the one I was just referring to before, I can tell you one thing. They are greatly motivated. They're greatly motivated because they realize that they have a lot of space to innovate because nothing has been done in that space. And if you then believe that getting your employees very satisfied in terms of what they do has got no impact on your bottom line, you're wrong. Because these people will be very committed and very proud of what they do. And this is, I think there are a lot of small instances like this where you need to think about it and where people would say, well, short term, it's not going to generate any profit and so I can't do that. But short term, long term. And think about multiple stakeholders, not just the immediate bottom line. I know it's easier said than done. I've been running a, a firm of 2,500 people with 100 partners. The 100 partners, they're all shareholders. So whatever money that goes out of the door, they feel this is money that doesn't come in my pocket. But still, they were very willing to do that type of investments also, in a way, cynically, you could argue, because they feel it will have indirect return long term. And so that's a bit what I wanted to, to share on that topic. 
Thank you very much. And Apirit, what can be done to um, to shift this burden from the, the victims, the survivors who are currently carrying it, onto uh, perpetrators and the global community? I think interestingly, one of the um, important thing to uh, to be aware of is that survivors are very often not heard in the discussion, and uh, and. Breaking the silence for them is very important, but it's also a way to break the taboo and, uh, and the silence of society, of, of the whole humanity on what's happening. So making sure that you listen to survivors and uh, making sure that uh, survivors can organize. So we, we try our best to help them to organize globally, but also at local level, that they can um, make their voice heard in the conversation with their communities. Uh, and that could be also how um, private companies could also be aware that there are survivor networks in different countries and, and understand their needs and, uh, and talk to them. Um, we also believe that, um, so by listening to survivors, we put the shame back on who the, the shame should belong to. So that's why breaking the silence is important. And then the shame goes back to the perpetrator. Um, but also we should not forget how survivors should be uh, supported in the long run because we sometimes tend to think, okay, perpetrators are condemned, it's okay, but the survivors also can be instrumental in their communities. Uh, they are active agents of change. They have uh, such resilience, as we saw, that they can make a big difference. So that's why we um, heard their demand for reparations, because that's not only a way to contribute to putting the shame where it should be, on perpetrators, on group, armed groups, on states, but also it helps them to be active in their communities and by doing so we are also building a peace where women are at the core of that peace building. And that also it's a way to address the causes because it's important to address the consequences of sexual violence in conflict, but at some point we will need to do more, much more than damage control. Now we need to stop it <laughs> from uh, starting and by having women who can talk about what they feel are the causes and can really like call on the international community, hey, this is, uh, by doing this or this, you are provoking wars and by provoking wars, you are provoking sexual violence. So that's why we are really uh, working on those two aspects, reparations, because that's also how the international community is gonna acknowledge the reality of sexual violence and this holistic care because by being cared for and back as a, as a full human dignity person, they are changing the communities. They are helping other survivors to, to, to speak out. In um, DRC, when the, um, the three survivors came back from Geneva last year, they started a movement. And in March um, this year, there were uh, unfortunately cases of mass rapes uh, uh, around Bukavu. They decided to do a big demonstration. 800 women survivors came together. That's impressive and they come because they feel they are together and this solidarity and the support of the local organizations help them to come together so uh, we need to make sure that uh, in terms also of uh, uh, human rights that maybe private companies think of survivors as uh, a way to help them to get back into society to get a job etc but also to think about their ways of working so that they don't kind of facilitate sexual violence to happen Thank you. Um, and so then following on to those important points that you just raised, um, I'd like to raise the question of power because often sexual violence is something that happens to people who are less powerful at the hands of those who are more powerful. But there's also a second element to it, which is that there are not institutions in these fragile environments that are powerful enough to protect their rights and to ensure that this kind of violence is prevented and also to ensure that it is punished when it occurs. And since all of you are in your own way involved in bringing the um, attention and resources of the global community to these survivors, I wonder if you could each share an experience from your career of a time that that made a difference, a time when because of your resources or because of your position or because of your connections to the global community, you were able to shift that power balance and help someone who was vulnerable or help a group that was vulnerable to to um, get justice, to get prevention, to get resources. Because I hope that by raising that sort of concrete example, it might give ideas to those of us in the audience um, of what kind of things might make a difference in the future. Pierre, do you, or uh, sorry, Céline, do you want to start? <laughs> um, well, it's <laughs> difficult. First, I told you the story of Vieta, which already is something. Um, 
No, but um, okay. Two things just before that. With what Eve was mentioning is that, for instance, we are not weapons of war. We are developing a, a technological um, tool, an app that is called Backup, on which I will not uh, put details. But uh, I share um, uh, what he was saying because it happened that we are working with Intech, uh, that is a company based in Luxembourg, and that is part of um, actually of a public. Uh, uh, state of Luxembourg and it's very interesting as an experience because for us they are now part of our team and they are just developer you know they knew nothing about sexual violence in conflict I remember the first time I met with them I was thinking oh my god you know what I'm going to tell them that there and it's been a year and we have developed a tool now and so I think I can see indeed the big added value because it opened to them uh, so to speak, another word, and it bring them, you know, some consciousness also. So actually, that I'm trying to make the link to what you ask. In a way, it's also um, a manner um, to uh, to impact on this because these people, they work, they are developer and etc. They have their life, and they knew nothing almost about all of this. Now they do, and they feel very motivated. And also in terms of innovation, they really develop something that were, that is getting amazing. So, um, so I wanted to say that though, these are ways to uh, connect together, and this is exactly how the private sector can get involved in that. Um, so I wanted to say uh, that, and um, I, 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 to be honest, I don't know how to answer <laughs> properly your question. The issue, for example, the issue also of prevention uh, is a big issue because how do you work on prevention? I think, hey, you need to work on awareness. I think there is, you know, and second, you need really to work on the change of mindset, and that takes so much time. But we need to do that. Um, then you know that's the big issue of war. I mean, I'm working on conflict zones, so I can come up and tell you, okay, let's say no to war. Okay, well, uh, I'm not sure Good it's idea. working, you know? I would love to see. But other things are happening. For instance, you know that today, um, actually yesterday, but uh, there was the, I don't know, if it, uh, in Cambodia, there is a special tribunal and there was a judgment for genocide. Genocide was recognized, I mean, it was confirmed for Cambodia and part of this judgment uh, include uh, sexual slavery and recognition of all the sexual violence crimes. This is a big thing because that is recognized as part of element of genocide. Uh, the UN, I'm working specially on Libya, uh, which is a very difficult country. Um, we are working on sexual violence against women, but also against men, because as I said at the beginning also, it's a tool and it's a tool that has an objective and sometimes it, tar it targets men. Because in Libya, for instance, the idea would be you know, to destroy men because they are the ones who are the tribal chief, who are on the public fora area. So how you destroy someone, you do that, you rape him and imagine a man, moreover a Muslim man, imagine all this context and situation for these people to be able to talk about what happened to them. And of course you destroy them and they disappeared from the public life. So that's actually a very efficient tool to destroy your opponent, so to speak. Um, but we worked on that and a week ago, I think, uh, the UN undertook sanction in Libya and they had it, we worked a lot on that, we lobby a lot in the UN, and they added sexual violence as a, a, a cause of sanction. So meaning that things are changing and we cannot say nothing is happening, things are happening and all these little things I think can create an environment where A, we will understand what we're talking about, this is very important. We will all stand up to understand that we cannot accept that because no one here would accept that, you know. So why we accept it in the world? This is, I mean, it makes no sense. And this, the third thing, and I finish on that, is that we can. This is also very important to say because I have so many people asking me this, and I understand. And but we can impact. We can have impact on things. You know, sexual violence in conflict is not a, like a fatality. It's not something that you say, okay, you know what, it happens for so long time, so what can we do? We can change it. The same way we can change the 
posture or how to say the, the behavior of men toward women. We can impact and change the relation between men and women. Of course we can do it. So this is something that we really need to keep in mind because um, if we do that, we are already <laughs> actually impacting. So I think that's, that's what I, I, uh, I want to say <laughs> about great. all this question that doesn't much. answer your no, question. No, it did. It, but <laughs> it was a great answer. And there was one thing in particular that I wanted to um, pull out from what you said, which I think is a really good point that often gets lost, which is that um, it's often very easy for sexual violence to be treated as a matter of private harm, that it is something right. that happens to civilians and that it is a problem for them in their personal lives. And it can be easy to lose the important point that you raised, that it's actually a matter of public harm as well, that yeah, it affects right. yeah. peace agreements, it affects who can participate in the public square. Um, and in that sense, it can contr contribute to instability even long after a conflict ends. And so I think that that is a great example of a way that you know the, the kind of voice of the international community and of experts like yourself can really change the way this issue is perceived. Um, and so if I could pose the same question to you, Eve, um, about how this could shift the power balance in favor of less powerful people. Yeah, uh, I'll take it not in, in the context of, uh, of sexual violence. Uh, I'll try and echo a few sentences I heard during the sessions over the last two days, which I believe are extremely important. And one of them is that the tone of at the top in a private company makes a lot of difference. And I'll take an example, which is, again, a little bit of a, of a situation of power relationship. And the example is, when I became CEO, every year we promote people based on their performance and how well they've done in the organization. And uh, the gender balance in our firm is far from ideal still. It's made huge progress, but it's still far from ideal. And I remember that one of the actions I took when I became CEO is once I heard about the story of a female manager which had been promoted to the next level. Her director was very pleased to inform her about her promotion. But then two weeks later, after the promotion, he heard she was pregnant. And he came back to her and he said, if you had been transparent about the fact that you were pregnant, you know you wouldn't have been promoted. I feel this is not very fair to hide the reality. It's a real story. And when I heard this, I thought, I'm going to call this man very quickly in my office. I told him this is totally unacceptable. You can consider that as a verbal warning and the next time you're out. But the second thing I did and I really thought it was afterwards very useful, is that I made that public. I didn't mention the name of the individual, but I said to an audience of 400 senior executives in the firm that this real story happened and that this was the outcome for the individual and saying to all the women in the audience, this is not acceptable. And I've had a lot of feedback afterwards in terms of people saying, well, at least this is different from a written code of ethics that all firms have and that we read. This is a true story that you shared and which really makes a big difference because, again, it's the real world. It's not simply a book. So, again, I've not precisely answered your answer, but this is what I wanted to share also. Because power struggles happen everywhere, in every organization, especially, obviously, in, in these dramatic situations. And it's our duty, as senior executives, to keep the balance right and say when things are totally unacceptable and take action. Um, I actually think it's a, a, it's a very relevant point to raise because one of the things that we find um, when we look at issues of sexual violence, whether they're in the workplace in developed countries or in conflict, is that it really matters to have women who are in power, that it really matters to have women who are in a position of authority and in a, who have an ability to say this is important, um, to understand it from a, the perspective of both a person 
who is female gender and also a person who has power and authority. Um, and one of the ways that women reach that level is by rising through the private sector. It's very important. Um, also, I would just like to say on a personal note, I'm currently on maternity leave, and so I'm very glad that there are people out there who are protecting women's ability to maintain their careers, even though they are leaving occasionally to have children. Um, <laughs> so, thanks. Um, and now if you'd like to address the same question and then we'll take questions from the audience. So the question of power is indeed very important because um, what we know uh, from sexual violence in conflict, but that would be the same for sexual violence in non-conflict situation, is that it's power that is uh, preventing people from speaking out. So the more survivor can speak out, the more power is challenged. Impunity and all of that, it's because there's a power issue that is not addressed or that's just normalized. And that's why we believe that by having more and more survivors speaking out, they are challenging this power thing. They are saying to the perpetrators, hey, I'm here and you expect me to just shut up because that's uh, how society works. But now I'm going to speak out. And by speaking out, I'm putting you on the spotlight and you will have to report, you will have to be accountable. And that's very, um, that's where, why challenging power is also um, putting the issue on the global sphere, because also perpetrators and states and whatever expect the thing to, to stay, as you say, private. And that was part of the whole women's rights movement to show that violence is not private, it's public. But that's the same in war. It's like, no, this is private, it's my country. But by making it a global issue, so by gathering survivors from all different countries, it's already a political statement. It's a global issue. It's not just in my country. Uh, and the states have to be accountable globally in front of the whole uh, global community and say, yeah, yeah, you know, my neighbor is doing the same, I'm doing the same, so there might be something that should um, be reported. Uh, and there's uh, also this global aspect is also what um, shifts like women's empowerment and some of them have been so inspired to meet women from other countries like the Colombian uh, women's rights movement is so strong and that empowered so much the women from DRC and now we, you, we see the women of DRC so strongly organizing that they empower women in Central African Republic and that's how it's going to really make a you know, this boule de neige <laughs> thing, I don't know how you translate that, to really uh, um, provoke a global movement. Uh, and then it also inspired women nationally to go back and have full of energy. There was a, a women's tribunal in uh, ex-Yugoslavia in 2015 where women publicly uh, spoke out, organized across borders, across religions, really sharing this as women, as part of this war that is now five or six different countries concerned, we share it, we, we, this is what we experienced. And that's really what the perpetrators don't want to see. They don't want to see an alliance. And then by doing this alliance, I think that's really challenging power because then um, they really are accountable um, publicly and they are on the spotlight and really hope that uh, uh, that all together we can really listen to survivors, support them to really um, continue this global alliance and that's why I think it's going to be part of how we can make a difference. Wonderful. Um, and if we could take questions from the audience now, um, we'll take three and then um, give the panelists a, an opportunity to answer. As you raise your question, please say which panelist um, you would like to respond if it's for a particular person. Hello, I just wanted to um, make two two different statements. One was uh, for Celine um, saying that um, uh, I'm grateful for, for your words as always very very inspiring and inciting and wanted to say that when we talk of rape as an arm of war I think we have to go back to what Dr. Mukwege has said when he became Nobel Peace Prize and that we do not realize enough. We're not only talking of rape as an arm of war, we are talking of more than that, it is really a crime against humanity because it's not only rape. With the rape, there is too often torture. Behind the act of rape, there is torture. And I won't go into the terrible details that we know, but this has to become part also of the momentum. And I find that it is not said sufficiently. That was for you, Celine, and for you, Monsieur Francis, I, I also wanted to tell you that I'm very grateful for every one of your words, and that um, I think really that more and more there is a need in general in companies to invest in something meaningful, 
and uh, I think there is more and more wish of participation and joining this mentality of Professor Yunus with social business that people want more and more to give a meaning to what they're doing, to their investments, and realizing that the ones who most need the credit and the financing should get a little bit of it at the end of the day. Thank you. My name is Sarah Burton. Um, well, thank you to all of you on the panel. It was an extraordinary session, and I'm, I'm very moved. I was moved by the first letter that we heard, but I'm just moved by all of your words and all of your actions. I have a question, because the sta this uh, session is about ending sexual vi uh, violence as a weapon of, of conflict in fragile environments, and I wonder if you could just comment on the thought that some of these conflicts, maybe not all of them, are funded by government outside the area of conflict, and arms are sold by governments and businesses outside the areas of conflict. And is there anything that we should be advocating for or trying to stop in the, um, uh, in the funding of or the arming of uh, those who perpetrate these uh, terrible violations? Is that for a particular panelist? I, or I'd be interested in anybody's thoughts on that. Okay, Thank great. you. And if we could uh, have one more question, and then we'll put them to the panel. Um, yeah, there's someone back there. Could you? And actually, I think we can take two questions, because the first one was a. Um, I just want to ask if you think that is, there is a hope for, uh, for the women that one day the people who are responsible of this kind of violence will be punished. Because as you know, even in uh, uh, the Iraqi war, uh, American soldier who was responsible, no one was uh, punished. So there's women in country like Libya or Syria have any hope. Okay. And is that for all three panelists as well? Or is that for a particular person? Okay. Okay. And then one last question back there and then we'll finish up. My question is for Celine. Celine, what are your financial needs to experiment the backup on the ground, and did you uh, find money? <laughs> All right, so since that's the most straightforward question, why don't you take that one first, and then we'll turn to the two broader ones. Thank you. The most useful question. Um, no, actually, uh, that's the point, because now we have a tool that is being, has been developed with the, um, the support of um, Intec Luxembourg, and that we have been using in Libya, and we see that it's working. Um, and now all uh, lots of countries are asking for it, and so we need money <laughs> to disseminate the tool uh, in this country, because the system is that you come, you present it, and they are like focal point, because you know we work at local level. It's like we create a kind of a relay, I don't know in English, like network, local network, and they are the ones spreading the, the system, helping um, to fill it in and etc. And, and uh, so yes, we need money. Um, because actually that's a good thing. Because you know, when we talk also about action, and I hear a lot about many things, and action and movies and etc. And, and communication about the issue, yes, it's one thing. But then at the end of the day, the organization that are working on that, uh, be it at local level or international level, uh, they need means, they need financial means to be able to work. And, and this is how the action is, is taken, you know, because otherwise with no money you cannot. So thank you very much for the question and, and, um, and yeah, sure, we need, we need lots of money. We, we uh, evaluate that we need, which actually is not that much when you look at, then I will go to your question that was very interesting. Uh, when you look at the word <laughs> and uh, all the money that is in the word, and there, it's not the fact that there is no money. We all know that there is lots of mo lots of money. Us with half a million, five hundred thousand euro, we can dis disseminate, you know, the the tool in uh, all over the world. 
and and have you know uh, feedback and and uh, and some uh, work to be done. You know, in Libya we did it in eight months, and we already have lodged a complaint in Paris that he's being. Uh, uh, recognize a leg um, eligible, you know that. Uh, so there is an investigation now open for, for uh, against a very high uh, general. So anyway, um, so and and then when it comes to Iraq and Libya, as you said, and and what you said, then I think it's a little bit different. Bec I mean, not different, but okay. We talk about conflict, and when we talk about conflict, we are talking exactly about what you say, <laughs> and that's why you're right. You know, I didn't see the the title. I didn't do that, <laughs> but um, first of all, ending uh, sexual violence in conflict. I, I I think we can. I think we can impact on that, but the the. Um, the real issue beside that is exactly all of this. The issue of conflict, the issue of, of um, how um, countries, I mean our European country, um, or the US or many other, the question is not to point at people, I mean countries, but uh, get involved into that. And, and I can feel, um, especially in France, but all over, you know, we can see that uh, more and more civil society and people are asking for accountability on that. We feel that, that citizens, they want that. And I think it's also very interesting uh, when we give also more light and, and power to the voices of survivors, because this is also probably something on which they can express themselves. If you take DRC, look at it. This is absolutely crazy. This country has been on war for 20 years for reasons we all know. You know, it's, it's economic, it's... Nobody gives a shit. I mean, forgive my French, but it's true. And and so and and then after we will be yeah. Oh my God, this poor survivor. What happened to? But please, you know, can we can we come back on the beginning? So of course, um, and and finish on that. What you said about yeah, the the uh, um, people <laughs> like you know Libya. It's very. Uh, I work on Libya since seven years. I'm French. Okay, so, you know, Libya and France, that's super complicated, uh, as you know. Um, but uh, be it Libya or uh, be it Iraq, uh, be it Syria, and the position of either the US or Russia or, you know, you go into politics and, um, and that's something that is, uh, you know, that is very difficult to deal with. I always, like, get out, out of, the things like this, you know, I always say, you know what, I'm a lawyer, so I don't do politics, but I'm, I'm tracking these people. But of course, there were some countries and some individual, uh, as individual Americans and people that, you know, could be accountable for, for certain things, uh, because there are also foreign army that have committed, if we go that, that committed crime on other country. And so uh, there are movement and, and uh, and the initiative to uh, prosecute also these people, but it's very complicated because again, it's about strong countries mm -hmm. and powerful countries and the other, you know? Right, yes. Um, okay, and do either of our other panelists want to respond to those questions? M maybe a quick word to your, to your question. Well, geopolitics is, is a very complex matter. Um, what I would say, and I agree with you, that unfortunately some of these conflicts are subsidized from foreign countries or private interest. The only way I could see a change in this is I was very emotionally touched with the young talents. And I believe we've seen recently in quite a lot of elections, it happened in Belgium, it happened in Germany, where a lot of the young people vote for green parties. I'm not advocating that they should do so, but the reaction was environment is not taken seriously by the older generations. And therefore, I would really call on the young people to have a less cynical view of the world than the one we have. Where, for example, you see Saudi Arabia, what's going on for the moment, that it's a complete joke. It's a complete joke. What happened to this man and the way countries react some not even saying anything, or others just shining away from saying something. And this is just totally unacceptable. But again, probably a lot of people think, well, this is geopolitics, this is the way the world runs. But I would welcome the fresh blood and the new eyes from the younger generations. And if they start being activist or voting differently than what we used to do, this is maybe 
something that could lead to some changes. But it's not a guarantee. And I think my fi final word would be about hope. Uh, I think there's hope. Um, there's hope because, uh, because survivors are speaking out. There's hope because, uh, uh, in put a bit, to put it back in the recent Me Too movement, there's people speaking out. And the more we speak about it, I think the more it's going to make a change. It's going to push uh, not only decision makers, justice systems, and all of us um, to break down our own stereotypes and to really be listening to people, to their real stories, and to, to stand up with survivors. So really, I think there's hope. And, and if we believe in it, as Celine said, if we, we can, so let's, let's do it. Okay, and that's a wonderful final call to action. Um, and we are now over time. Um, do we need a call to action from the other two panelists as well? Is there anything that you guys would like to add or are you, you've said what you need to say? Okay, thank you so much. <laughs>